I'm Jesse Hill with the Jesse Hill Real Estate Group and Coldwell Banker Legacy. On this very special episode of Our Journey, we will explore the profound world of Pueblo pottery and showcase three accomplished artists. Native American pottery from New Mexico's Pueblo communities is one of the most desired and highly developed art forms, dating back to 1050 AD. Today, this rare and beautiful art form is passed down from elders to other family members and produced by various tribal communities in New Mexico who have added their own style, design, and unique color. Welcome to the land of the Tewa Pueblo people. Uh, I'm from the Tewa village of Nambe Uinge, and uh, I gave you my Tewa name and my Christian name, our Western name is Lonnie the Hill, and I work with the micaceous pottery. I started experimenting with uh, micaceous pottery sometime in the early 1980s. At that point, I was on a life discovery. I come from a pottery family in my village, and by conversation with my mom and her sisters and other relatives, and so I just sort of collected all of that information and knowledge together and then just began applying it. And so it was clear to me that this is what I was supposed to be doing because not only was I very happy doing it and I felt very satisfied, I looked forward to it so much every morning to get up early and just start working. Hello, I'm uh, Jason Ablecker. My Indian name is Pete Siddin. That means uh, red bird. I'm from uh, Santa Clara Pueblo. Uh, my father and my grandmother are the ones that taught me the most about uh, pottery. They taught me technique and about uh, how I, uh, how to put everything together. You know, the polishing, every step they taught me. And as a, as a child, uh, we would uh, go and watch my grandmother, my uh, father, and we would be set in a corner with a piece of clay and we would be told to make animals or different figures. <laughs> Okay, With respect, uh, my name is Buente Jordan Atencio. I am from the pueblos of Oke Wingi and Santa Clara. I am the granddaughter of Sharon Aranjo Garcia. I learned traditional pottery from, from her just as she learned from her grandmother. I've been encouraged by uh, friends and uh, relatives from other pueblos who said, why don't you enter Indian market? And I just thought to myself, well, there's a long line and, and, and my work and our work, how is it going to fit into that whole scene? Well, anyway, we decided to go and we were selected and we went to Indian market and we got some wonderful uh, awards that first year. And, and many people came to our booth and were interested in um, looking at our work and purchasing it as well. That sort of began to open up my participation in various different markets. But um, that's not where I began marketing my work. I would sell my work at the Palace of the Governors. And also my cousin Juan Tafoya and I from San Alfonso, he was a potter and for many years I had helped him with his work in displaying and selling. And so we would go to various pueblos on feast days and we had a table there and we would both sell our work there. And he was kind enough to share and let me sell my pieces with him. I started about 15 when I uh started entering to uh, India Market, the youth class, you know, got a few ribbons there and uh, started, you know, not really making a name, but, you know, trying to uh, show off the pieces and my skills. When I turned 18, I wanted to be a chef. So as I did that, I was still making pottery on the side. I would do uh, India Market every year. So I was 32 when I started, uh, when I decided to do uh, full time. and. In that effort, I asked my mother to help me if she could support me for three years. In those three years, I started making, uh, getting a little bit more awards because I was putting the time and effort into those pieces and uh, putting the quality that, that deserves it. Pottery has been a significant part of my family's history going back eight generations to Serafina Tafoya. As a university student majoring in biology and planning on continuing my education in graduate school, Pottery allows me to reconnect to who I am and where I come from. Today, there are very few, few potters carrying on the OK Winge traditional style. 1920, back in that time period, when it seems as though there were collectors from the curators at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture and the School of Advanced Research, but they began the, the collecting. So even prior to that, um, those people were buying pottery and they were reselling them, you know, because there was a market for it. 
three pueblos, as far as I understand the history, Taos, Picaris, and ourselves were making them, so there were fewer number of micaceous pieces than were of the polychrome pieces in the Tewa villages, as well as the polished red and blackware. And of course, the, the polished red and blackware has been made by all Tewa people, just as the polychrome work has been made by all Tewa people. When we first started uh, the process of the whole thing, we go out, uh, there's a place in Santa Clara that everybody from the Pueblo goes and gets the clay. So we go and dig it out, it comes out, it looks like milk chocolate almost. So you want the, the nice shiny piece. It takes, you know, for maybe like three or four buckets, it takes like almost half the day to, to even just harvest that. And for the sand, it's about the same, you know, you go to certain places and, you know, they have the pits that you dig out. Take them home, we dry out the clay, go and process it through a screen to get all the rocks and roots so it's nice and smooth and there's no, if it has any uh, material like that, that causes the cracking and it'll mess up the polish after you polish it. We will, we mix the sand and the clay together and then we leave it sitting for, I usually leave it sitting for about a month or so. I use a pancake method. So I roll out a, a piece of clay, a size of pancake, whatever size I'm making, put it in the bowl, we call it a cookie. But we put it in there and then we start coiling after. So each coil, you know, depending on the size of the clay, you know, it, it goes from an inch to two inches, depending depending on the size of the pot. And then after that, we let it dry. If we're going to put, carve anything into it, we do it at that time. So we design it and then carve that out. We let it completely dry, sand it down, and then we polish it. We add a slip to it, but it's actually a, a natural clay. We paint on there and then we burnish it with a stone. And then after, after that's dried out, we put grease on it and then polish that to a high, high shine. Then it's ready to fire. Uh, it's all outdoor firing. Uh, we have uh, metal racks that we put around it so nothing caves in on it or nothing drops in on, on it. And then we put wood all the way around, burn that, and it turns like a real uh, chocolate color. So all the soot burns off and everything else, and that's for the red. But for the black, at that point that it turns that chocolate color, we cover it with manure and we let it oxidize. We'll, we'll let it cool down, pull it out, get a wet towel, wipe, wipe it down, a dry towel and kind of buff it out and the pieces are ready to go. The future of Pueblo pottery is very exciting as new artists challenge themselves with new shapes and designs. Long ago, pottery was made for carrying water or cooking. Today, pottery is also made for traditional uses, but it's also made for a consumer market, which is a lot smaller. In the future, I see pottery and more traditional shapes and designs returning, as it is the closest reinterpretation our ancestors taught those that came before us. Each potter has their own uniqueness, yet are still connected to a specific family, pueblo, and region. It is the love that ensures each piece of pottery is unique in its own right. I hope this immersive journey into the beautiful Native American art world of New Mexico's diverse pueblo communities has been informative. Join us next time as we review the Santa Fe and Northern New Mexico market, explore top picks and food, fun, and your next adventure.